So welcome uh, to today's lecture and uh, while we have done in the earlier classes on uh, some of these uh, introductory versions of uh, convolutional neural networks and trying to get down into what is an abstraction of trying to understand a deep convolutional neural network. Here uh, today we would be starting with something called as a VGG net that is uh, a short acronym for the group from where it originates out. So this originates out from the visual geometry group and uh, that is where the name comes down as uh, VGG. So while uh, in the earlier lectures we had already studied about uh, how uh, the different characteristics of the network as well as the architecture and how it is linked out how the data flow happens down. Today what I am going to do predominantly is actually to go through this uh, whole set of codes over here which will be showing you how this whole architecture is implemented and then the learning as uh, progresses through it. Okay. So, uh, let us let us just go through how it works out. So, the first part of here is uh, just a set of your header files which we are going to use for, for all the purpose. So, I am just uh, it is the same set of headers which are present down in all the earlier codes which we are going to reuse over here as well. Now, if you see that this is a run version which I am using and one of the reasons is that this network being quite deep uh, it, it takes us. Uh, substantial amount of time in order to compute if we are just going to run through the epochs that is runs in a few minutes in the order of a few minutes actually. Um, typically about 15 to 20 minutes over there and uh, in order to keep it just precise and within the time limit of uh, our recordings I am just using a network which is already trained out and uh, the states of it which is preserved over here. So that, that does not change anything from your side because you will be provided with an untrained network uh, over there which you will have to actually train it start training it from the scratch and then you would see how the network gets trained and uh, its performance increases over there. So this is the first part of it which is just my uh, header files over there which I need to copy down for my library calls whichever I want to do. The next part is to go around and do with the data. So on my data what I use is the standard CIFAR. So as in you had seen in the earlier lecture on AlexNet where we had uh, Although AlexNet was trained down for uh, image network kind of classification problems which has 1000 uh, categories in which you have to classify and all the images are of size 224 cross 224. So here we are going to uh, use down CIFAR and uh, since the images are of size uh, 32 cross 32. So we need to rescale it out and uh, I am using the same kind of a transformation scale factor over here which will be applying the transformations on the data as which is getting loaded over here. So that is just to keep it aligned with what we have done in the earlier one as well. And uh, now uh, that is just my train loader and my test loader. So both my data files get loaded over there and then you see that the files are present so it is verified. And finally we run down and check down what is the total number of samples. So that is quite same as we had for our CIFAR 10. So 50,000 uh, images on the training sample over there and 10,000 images for my testing. And that is with what I am going to start working on. Now you had seen down in AlexNet it was quite easy because you could actually call down your models over here and that is a uh, library within uh, Torch Vision. So within Torch Vision you have a definition uh, architecture over there available within the function called as models. So here I just need to invoke uh, my call to VGG16. Now VGG16 is basically that layer which has 16 learnable uh, parametric layers in total and then uh, that is the one which we are going to use. So once we have this model loaded down and then I can print and look through it. So if you see through it you would see your uh, it is sort of like uh, one by one blocks which are connected down as in your VGG. So the first block was a battery of two subsequent uh, 2D convolutions and finally after that you have a uh, max pooling operation coming down and then again uh, 2D convolution. So the first one is what converts down from 3 channels onto 64 channels. So that is the battery of filters uh, which you have within the first convolution layer. Each filter is of size 3 cross 3 uh, with a stride of 1 and a padding of 1 which means that whatever is the size of the input which goes over here the same is the size of the output which comes out from this 2D. Th this, this is what happens in essence over here. Now then you have a nonlinear function which is ReLU and subsequent to that you again have a 2D convolution which maps down 64 layers uh, which come as an output from uh, the earlier 2D convolution onto another 64 layer. So there are 64 such unique kernels which get defined over here and uh, your kernels are again 3 cross 3 in the spatial uh, size. It has a stride of 1 and a padding of 1 as goes down. Okay. Good. So in the next version what I do is we have uh, ReLU again put down as a nonlinearity and then you have a max pooling. Uh, operation coming down over here which is a 2 cross 2 max pooling and then subsequent to that we have uh, a 2D convolution and then again a ReLU and then again a 2D convolution and then a ReLU. 
So this is the second battery which comes down whereas this max pooling has now reduced down the size by doing a uh, uh, so it, it uses a max pool kernel of 2 cross 2 and with a stride of 2 and for that reason it just reduces to half of the size. So from 224 cross 2 to 4 uh, which was the spatial size at the output from here you get it reduced to 112 cross 112 at the result of this particular uh, block which is being called down. And then uh, uh, that 120, uh, 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 so 112 cross 112 sized uh, image is or, or that block over there. So there is it's 64 number of channels and 112 cross 112 is the spatial span over there. Now that is again convolved with 128 unique kernels in order to get down 128 uh, uh, channels or slices coming down on the output. Each kernel is of size 3 cross 3 with a stride of 1 comma 1 and a padding of 1 in place and then you have your uh, ReLU coming down as a nonlinear function. Now we do not have any further uh, max pooling over here but that again succeeds by another uh, battery of 128 convolution kernels uh, each of size 3 cross 3 and uh, stride of 1 comma 1 and padding of 1 comma 1. So that would mean that uh, the resultant of this one is also of a spatial size of 112 cross 112. Subsequent to that you have your ReLU and then a max pooling which brings it down to half of the size. So that makes it 56 cross 56 because of the size and stride and then you keep on uh, doing that. So over here you again have in the next battery you have uh, 3 convolution kernels which would come down and uh, subsequent to that you have your next max pooling. Now following that you again have uh, 3 convolution kernels coming down over here and then a max pooling. Subsequent to that you again have uh, 3 convolution kernels and then a max pulley. Okay. Now over here as a resultant which comes down is has uh, 512 such channel uh, channels across the volume which is coming out over there and uh, then in total if you look into the total number of neurons present over there so that total number of neurons after linearization is uh, 25088. 25,088 such neurons. So this in the first uh, fully connected layer is what connects it down to 4,096 neurons. Then uh, we have a dropout which uses a 50 percent dropout ratio over here. These 4,096 neurons are again connected down to 4,096 neurons and then you have a 50 percent dropout coming down over here. And finally these 4,096 neurons are again connected down to 1,000 neurons. Now this is your VGG net in the classical style. However, uh, the kind of data which we are using in CIFAR 10, uh, that is a 10 class problem. So if you just have 1000 uh, neurons over there, it does not make sense because it will not be learning. For 990 neurons, it will not have any uh, data to train it down because those classes are just missing over there. So in order to do that, what we are going to do is just a tad bit of modification. This is still untrained, so it does not create any sort of a problem inside over there as well. And for that what we do is we keep on modifying this one. So first point is just delete out this last uh, layer over here and then introduce a fully connected connection between 4096 neurons to 10 neurons and that is what will solve it out. So that is what is exactly introduced over here and now if you print your whole network so you would be able to see that the last layer is now which connects from 4096 neurons onto 10 neurons and, and quite simple and sweet solution to this problem. Okay, so now we have our VGG net which is modified on to take down and classify up to 10 neurons. Now with this modified architecture which just classifies it on to 10 classes and not 1000 classes as was in the original image net problem, we need to find out what is the total number of parameters which goes down. So for that I will be looking into uh, my first layer. So my first layer basically has 3 cross 3 kernels and uh, the Z direction or the number of channels in that kernel is also 3 because that matches down with the uh, number of channels present down in my input image okay. and there are 64 such unique number of uh, kernels which are present over there. So that makes it 64 into 3 into 3. Okay. Now with each of these 64 kernels you also have a bias associated with it and that is this 64 number uh, of biases which comes down. So this is for my first layer. Okay. So my second convolution layer will have uh, uh, the input over there has a depth or the number of channels of the input data is 64. The spatial span is 3 and 3 still. So this becomes 64 into 3 into 3 and I have 64 such number of unique kernels coming down. So that makes it 64 into 64 into 3 into 3 and I have uh, one bias associated with each of these uh, kernels over there. So that makes it 64 additional biases and then uh, this is what is added down. 
Subsequent to that I connect down 64 uh, channels on 228 channels with the 3 cross 3 convolution kernel and for each channel I have 128 biases. So, so on and so forth I can keep on going till uh, I reach down a point over here which is my end of convolution layers. So, beyond that what I have is a connection of uh, 25088 neurons to 4096 neurons and for each of in the fully connected layer. So, that is the first fully connected layer which comes down. So, you have uh, 25088 neurons connected down to 4096 neuron and each of these 4096 neuron also has 11 bias coming down over there and that is this additional 4096 which gets added. Now, 4096 neurons are again connected to 4096 neurons and then you have an additional bias of 4096 number of elements. The final one is which connects on 4096 neurons to 10 neurons and for each of the neuron you have an additional bias which comes down over here. Now, if you take down a total of all of these parameters this is what it comes down. So, that is uh, closely about 134 million parameters. So, this uh, is, is a number. So, somewhere over here is, is your uh, dot if you would like to put that. So, this becomes 134 dot 301514 into 10 power of 6 or 130 roughly about 134 million parameters over there. Now, if it was an original VGG net which has 1000 neurons to which it was mapped. So, obviously, that would be a larger value then instead of this 10 over here this becomes 1000 the number of biases over here also become 1000. So, that is the change which would happen if we move it over to a standard uh, VGG net for the image net kind of a problem. Now, once this is done my network is completely established. Now, what I would like to do is that just copy down my random weights and keep it for my use if, if I want to do anything and then typically as with the earlier examples I was actually visualizing a doubt and trying to show you uh, how these things are changing over there. Okay. Now, following this uh, what I do is actually check down if my GPU is available. Now, if my GPU is available then I can get uh, it running and started on the GPU itself. So, once having done that the next is uh, the classical thing which is to look down into uh, what kind of a problem I am trying to solve. So, here uh, the kind of a problem is a classification problem. So, the cost function which I am going to use is going to be a classification cost function and for that purpose we make use of the negative log likelihood cost function over here. And then finally, I have my optimizer which is to be used and this optimizer which I make use of over here is the Adam optimizer plain simple Adam adaptive momentum uh, optimization over here. Now, this solves my part of the loss function and the optimizers which I am supposed to use. Them. The next part is to look through my network. Okay. So, what I do within my training part over there. So, till here you had your uh, network defined the total number of parameters taken down your GPU availability checked and then uh, your training and loss functions defined. And the next part is quite uh, straightforward that you are going to look down through uh, the whole training process. Now, the training process is in no way different and by now you should have been <laughs> getting used to and accustomed that uh, the best part of all of this is that it is too modular in structure. So, you can just uh, have all of these definitions uh, taken down and kept down over there and based on whatever is your network definition in your net just changing that definition is what solves the rest of your problems over here. So, not, nothing major to change as such. So, over here what I do is uh, I start down my iterations uh, or my number of epochs over there within each epoch I just initialize my timer and then uh, what I do is uh, I start my uh, training data loaders. Now, if my GPU is available then uh, it is typecasted as a CUDA variable so that it is available on the GPU as well and then after that what I do is I zero down all the gradients within my optimizer the first step of uh, just zeroing down gradients so that we do not have any residual gradients pumping through the network over there. The next part is doing a feed forward over the network which comes down over here. Once your feed forward is done you have these outputs available over there you can find out your loss function. Now, your uh, criterion over here being uh, negative log likelihood. So, we needed to take a log softmax transfer function over there as well and then you can convert uh, and then you can actually find out what is the, uh, the computed value of the loss between your output and the labels. So, whatever thing was predicted over there with whether it was matching down your labels or not. Okay. So, once your loss is there next we need to find out what is uh, nabla of the loss or nabla of j or, or the first derivative of the cost function and that is what we need and that is what is computed using the backward operator over here. And finally, once the loss is computed you need to do your back propagation. So, that is with the optimizer dot step running it on over there and then uh, over uh, each batch we are supposed to 
just sum up uh, what is the total loss coming down okay and then the average loss is what is divided by the total batch size which gives you the standard average loss coming down and then what you can do is create an array of training loss so that at every epoch you know exactly how the loss was moving down and what was the loss at the end of uh, every epoch during an epoch of training now once that's done the next part is to look into the validation and what we make use of over here is the standard validation set which we have access to so this is the test data set which is available over there which has not been used during the training process so what we do is uh, we just uh, run down our uh, data within the test loader part over there and then if my gpu is available then typecast it onto my gpu things and then uh, uh, once the typecasted variable is available in terms of cuda or available on the gpu memory i can do a forward pass over the network and then get down whatever is my predicted uh, value of the class which comes down and that's the result of this max operator coming down over here now once it's predicted down what i do is just convert it onto my cpu and, and uh, bring it back over here so that i can do the rest of the uh, uh, calculations the rest of the calculation is pretty simple that i need to compare whatever is my predicted value of the label whether that's the exact value of the label on the data which i'm using over there and if it's so then that's correct so just take a sum over all of them then that is going to give me the total number of correct things i have done and uh, that's out of one th uh, that's out of the 10000 samples which are available in my testing data so if i divide this by 10000 i get down my average accuracy coming down over here and then uh, i just decide to put down my average testing accuracy per epoch in terms of an array which i can use it for subsequent uh, inferencing over there now the next part is uh, pretty simple so this is just to plot down your uh, training errors as well as your validation uh, accuracy over there so while your training error is expected to go down your validation accuracy over time is expected to go up as it comes down and then this just keeps on printing it out so now once you train it down you would see that uh, it does take a significant amount of time so an epoch takes roughly like 15 minutes or 17 minutes of time going down over there and for that reason we had just chosen down only five epochs now you need to keep in mind so networks like alexnet or uh, linets they are much smaller in size and then the number of compute which happens down is much smaller whereas over here um, you have large number of computes the total number of parameters which you are learning the total number of parameters which get updated over there is also large and it's it's for this reason that you are going to take down more amount of time deeper networks are computationally expensive but then uh, later on when we get into studying down even more uh, deeper networks uh, like residual networks and others of the like you will realize that it's it's not always necessary that you need to have a lot of parameters only if you have a deeper network it's just by a mathematical scaling of the width of the network which is also a critical factor in terms of determining the total number of parameters which you have to tune as you go across the network now if you look into it you start with a training loss initially of uh, 0.02 within the end of first epoch it drops down almost to half of it and then it keeps on steadily declining over there the accuracy starts roughly at 56% uh, but you need to keep in mind that uh, when the network was initially started down and then we had batch updates which were going down now my batch size over here which i had defined within my loader uh, somewhere over here is 64 now i have 50000 such uh, samples available and i am loading those into uh, number of batches which is 64 so i get down basically 50000 divided by 64 number of updates happening within each epoch so after that many number of updates so that's that's uh, roughly 50000 divided by 64 is about 8000 uh, of updates which go down over there and with that many updates happening down within uh, each epoch you already Uh, raised to a uh, accuracy of 56% at the end of the first epoch when when it stops training okay then you go down to the next epoch and you see at the end of the next epoch you have a jump which is almost um, 16 uh, almost 15% above the earlier case and goes down to about 71% from there it has a 6% jump going down to 77% from there a 2% jump to 79% and then it somewhat comes down to a point of where it might be hitting down saturation so this is a point where uh, you can still keep on training uh, playing around with the uh, learning rate over there maybe reduce the learning rate and then you would see this increasing over there so what happens down on my loss curve is my loss curve is still monotonically looking like it it's going to decrease significantly although my accuracy comes down as if it's going to saturate out however this is a whole trade off so my slope of accuracy increase does not uh, become so high uh, whereas my errors which are back providing and still tuning out my weights are are significant and then what i need to do over here is basically uh, fix down the learning rate such that uh, it 
it keeps on coming down to its actual global minima instead of getting stuck in the local minima over there. So that is what we had already discussed earlier and then uh, finally what I do is on my model which has been trained over here I just copy down my weights and keep them and then try to visualize it out. So my visualization routine is the same as we had done in the earlier case and the first model is to look down into this first set of uh, convolution layer. So the first convolution layer which connects down your image space onto 64 channels over there. So what I do technically is each is a 3 cross 3 kernel and that is why you have these 3 cross 3 patches and then you have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 patches over here and similarly you have 8 number of rows coming down as well and that makes a total number of 64 patches which corresponds to 64 unique kernels which has been learnt by uh, the first convolution layer over there and each takes in RGB or 3 channel inputs. Okay. Now from there uh, uh, th these were the weights which were at the start of the training or what was randomly available down to everyone for use. Now this is what happens at the end of training of all of these 5 epochs by the time it has reached almost till 80 percent of an accuracy. Now it, it still does not quite make sense because you do not you are not able to see down figures if you had larger size kernels you might be able to make sense of what kind of wavelets these are but uh, these are some sort of feature extractors uh, quite similar to convolutional extract feature extraction with wavelets which are quite useful and, and these exist on the color space as well. So, but looking down into my weights I can see that there have been decays there have been certain number of weights which had a different kind of a change so they were not shades of the same color which were changing but they actually end up getting a different color as well. So that is that is what we have over here in this one, in this one, in this one, this one and then you see significant amount of change coming down and then this in total makes down that uh, the change which happens although you do not see it evidently in, in terms of getting down a very crisper kind of a structure but uh, although the structure is not very crisp and geometrically what can be defined down but what it learns is necessary in order to actually wire down all the neurons. Uh, which are characteristic of a certain kind of an object and that is the reason why these group of neurons would be helping you in uh, classifying the whole process. So later on uh, in the lectures when we go down we will also be looking down how to track down on how these neuron activations are and then what is the area from where a certain kind of an activation is coming down in order to find out what regions of an image are what are very significant of a particular kind of a class of object and can we actually go down to understanding from a classification problem like which attributes of an image as they appear visually are what is important and significant in order to classify it belonging to that class. Now this is for my first layer over here then I go into looking down into my second convolution layer and what I choose over here is to take down my first kernel of my second convolution layer. Okay. Now on the my first kernel of my second convolution layer I have 64 channel output which comes down from my earlier convolution layer and all of these 64 are mapped down to a kernel over here. So there is technically this kernel is a 64 cross 3 cross 3 in size and what I choose to do is uh, I take down one of these kernels or the first kernel over here and then I just display each of these channels as individual blocks over here. So that is why you see them in uh, grayscale uh, shades over here. So there are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 of them and there are 8 rows over there and each of these is a 3 cross 3 that is for the purpose of visualization. So this is my initially randomized things. This is what comes down after training over 5 epochs and then if you look into our changes or the differences between them then this is the kind of difference which comes down. So all of them have been exposed to certain kind of a thing and in fact for a lot of them you do see a gradient kind of a behavior. So this is where there are almost uh, horizontal gradients coming in to play down a significant role in how they are changing. This is where you have some sort of a vertical gradient as well. So this uh, in total is what happens down uh, when training it down with a VGG net for the first few layers and uh, although it takes a lot of time and then it does have a lot of parameters and subsequently the number of computations which you do but it is always nonetheless fine and one of these uh, models is, is what was a ruling model for a longer period of time. You have other options of uh, going down to a VG19 as well uh, so that is up to your exploration. So I leave it up to you what you need to basically change is uh, go into the documentation of uh, torch vision and look into your models part over there. And then once you have it, so what you can change is here where you are just referencing it out. So if you want to go down with the VGG19, you can just write it as 19. You go down with any other models available over there, you can just 
pull and do. So in the subsequent ones where we do some of these very standard models and trying to understand uh, their implementation issues, while we have also already covered down their uh, theory aspects over there, we will be getting you into details of how to recall over there and how to modify. And these are all models remember which are not trained initially, these were uh, all randomly initialized and then available from scratch. Whereas on the models over there, uh, on the standard release library, you also have trained models which means that they have been already been trained by ImageNet for a large number of epochs by the time they reached on the saturation. Uh, accuracy of somewhere more than 90 percent, somewhere about 95, 97 percent over there and those models with the trained weights are also kept down for use and then that is in a later point of time when we go into understanding domain adaptation and transfer learning is where we will be making use of them. So till then uh, stay tuned and while we resume back for uh, more deeper networks as well.